All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 Hillsborough County Charter Review Board meeting for the month of July 2020. Uh, this meeting is officially called to order, and we're going to go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. It's great to see everyone here. We just did a roll call. and It appears that we have not only a quorum, but everyone is in attendance for today. I hope that you and your families are staying well during these incredible times. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into the public comment section of our meeting. We do have um, a email submission that came in, and we do have someone that has called in. The Charter Review Board does welcome comments from citizens about any issue or concern. Your opinions are valued in terms of providing input to the board members. However, it is requested at the same time when you address the board that comments are not directed personally, but rather directed at the issues. This provides mutual respect between the board members and the public. And so at this time, I'll go ahead and read the one email that we have, and then we'll check to see if Mr. Nash is on the line for comment. And this um, email submission has come in from, it looks like a Ms. Karen Deroach. Uh, I'm not gonna read the full address, but it is Tampa, Florida, 33624. And the comment says, I am in favor of nine single members districts so that one, we can get commissioners closer to the people from 350,000 per commissioner to 155,000 per two, we solve the term limit loophole. My commissioner is in his 16th year with two more to go. Three, county-wise represent 1.4 million people, which is the size of two U.S. congressional districts, exclamation point, too big, exclamation point. Redistricting should remain in the BOCC's hands a legislative body rather than a commission, independent or planning commission. Also, charter amendments should have legal review so we don't have the problem we've had with all for transportation initiative that has had legal issues. Again, that's Karen Jaroch. Mr. Brewer, is Mr. Nash on the line? No, sir. No one for public comment has called in yet. Okay, and we'll review this again at the end of the evening. Uh, in case he dials in before that time. Um, moving right along. We will leave it open. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving along in our agenda tonight, we have the approval of the clerk's official minutes. Has everyone had an opportunity to look at the meeting minutes from June 2nd, 2020? Is there any unreadiness or concern? I move for approval. Motion to approve. I'll second okay. the motion. Sounds like we have a motion from Dr. Fox and a second from Mr. Johnson for approval. Any concerns? Are you ready for the question? All in favor of sign of aye? Aye. 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 Any of Aye. Thank you all. Moving right along, I just want to provide you with a quick update. Um, as you know, at our last meeting, we decided to invite the outgoing county administrator, Mr. Mike Merrill, to come in and, and possibly give some remarks to us at this meeting. Um, unfortunately, he declined uh, to attend this meeting. Um, we all know that effective June 30th was his last day with the county, and he, he resigned. Um, and now Ms. Bonnie Wise has taken over as a new county administrator, and she's asked for a little bit of time before coming to the board. She just started the job officially six days ago on uh, the, the first, uh, and we all know there's been a holiday period, but we're looking at possibly the October meeting to have her come in and give a full presentation on, on her office. So I would just ask for the members, uh, patience, as we let her ramp up a little bit in the job before she comes in, but she will come in to talk to us. That being said, um, we do have um, Ms. Peggy Caskey tonight from the County Internal Auditor's Office who's uh, come to give a presentation and to answer uh, questions that were submitted earlier. So we'll just ask for your attention as we hear from Ms. Caskey. Ms. Caskey, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Um, I don't have a presentation today, um, but I did provide um, the board a, um, a historical record, a five page document. Um, I would assume that everybody has received that and has had an an opportunity to take a look at that. 
read it? Yes, ma'am, I have. Uh, and I'm, but I, I don't have a question. I'm sorry, I don't have any question in that. Um, but does anybody have any questions for me um, after taking a look at that? And I, I do have a question. Okay. Jamie, yes, sir, you're ready now. Okay, Ms. Ms. Cassidy, just curious, um, uh, in, in the end of the history, and by the way, it's a very fascinating history, I appreciate you providing that. Um, it discussed a resolution made by the Board of County Commissioners, I believe in February, 20-11, mm -hmm. um, if, if I'm thinking right here. Yes. And, um, I, I didn't see that resolution in, in the document, and then I went looking for it and couldn't find it. And then I noticed that uh, Muni code wasn't updated with it yet. What, what's the status of that resolution? Um, the resolution was approved in February. Um, and the only change in that resolution was um, we had changed a little bit on the um, qualifications of an audit committee member. Um, because when we had made the change prior to that, we thought that we were expanding that out so we would get a, bit, a bigger group of individuals for participation. And what right. happened was instead it narrowed the scope. So what we did was we just made a couple tweaks to, I think it was like one sentence, maybe two sentences in there. Okay. Um, you don't have to have that resolution with you, do you? I do not, but I can certainly send that to you if you'd like. That would be fantastic. Okay. All right, great. Do we have any other questions from Ms. Cassidy? I have a question, Mr. Chair. And you're recognized, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for a, a great um, history uh, summarized 20 years in, in five, four pages. It's pretty excellent. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, I think it's, well, it was on my third page when I printed it. I'm not sure. It's where you have the bullet points where you have examples of the projects that you've completed. Ms. Caskey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, where you have the uh, bullet points, the right. fifth bullet down where it starts uh, since the Oracle Enterprise Resource Planning Systems Implementation. Yes. I, I'm having a little trouble understanding what that is. Could you just real briefly explain what that is? Sure. Um, about five to seven years ago, the Board of County Commissioners um, had implemented the Oracle Enterprise System. It's called an uh, Oracle ERP system. And what that is, is it's the main um, software database that's used throughout the county. It's for financial records, budgeting, we do uh, payroll, um, human resources, a big variety of information goes into that. Um, and what it was is when the, when the system was set up, um, it was set up in such a manner that, that met the needs at that time. But over the years, um, it really needed to be tweaked a little bit more to meet our current needs. Um, the other thing that was on there, which you'll see on, the, um, on my current audit plan, is where we're now um, just looking at the implementation of um, Oracle Cloud. So that is a project that we will be starting in July or August. Um, so as soon as the board accepts a contract to do the implementation, then we'll be stepping into that project at the same time and auditing at the speed of risk. So what system do we have right now? Right now we have Oracle, but it is not the cloud. I see. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a system that's on its own. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Does anyone else have any questions for Ms. Kasker? And remember, we do have the option of uh, raising your hand in the system if we have multiple comments or questions. I can't find that. Oh, I see it now. Okay, thank you. All right, going once, going twice. Ms. Kasky, it looks like you're getting off the hook very easy tonight. 
Thank, thank you for you. taking time out of your your Tuesday evening to be with us. Well, I see, I see Representative Fink. I see your hand, and you're on mute currently. Representative Fink, you're on mute. Well, there you go. Oh, that did it? Now we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I, I wanted to call, wanted to thank Ms. Kasky for the excellent report that she gave us. I appreciate her good work very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, very, very thorough. I have to agree. I mean, that history was very concise. Thank you very much for that and the work that your office does for our county. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a great evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. You're very welcome. Good evening. All right, members, at the last meeting, um, some questions were asked about the redistricting process, and we instructed staff to come back and provide information. Uh, last week, they provided a lot, of, uh, a lot of documents about the county structure here in Hillsborough, but also the other counties here in the state of Florida to your respective emails. And I'm sure in that time frame, we've had a lot of questions that may be posed. Uh, tonight, we have our general counsel, Ms. Mary Helen Ferris, with us that can talk to any of the questions that you may have um, regarding this process or the makeup of the board and things of that nature. Um, I see a couple of hands already. Um, I'm going to go ahead and recognize Mr. Scarola first, and then um, I'll give the floor over to Ms. Ferris. Thank, thank you, Ed, I appreciate that. Um, board members, I, I was kind of fascinated by that public comment actually in the beginning uh, here by, if I got her name right, Karen Jorosh, who, who I don't know at all. Um, but I went through the information and I came up with a couple of interesting facts, at least for me. Um, which was the direction I was headed uh, to try to understand where we were going uh, with the county and its population. And uh, in, this, in this issue of um, getting representation for all. <clears throat> and, and so some of the facts that stood out during this review to me were that now Hillsborough has taken the place of number four in the state of Florida for uh, population in terms of uh, county size. Uh, that's at 1.44 million. So the order that I see in this information is Miami-Dade at 2.8, Broward at 1.9 million, Palm Beach at 1.447, and Hillsborough at 1.444. So we are, for all intents and purposes, almost exactly where Palm Beach is in terms of uh, of population. And then when you reviewed the, um, the charts of representation, <clears throat> what stood out was that Miami-Dade had 13 districts at a population of 2.8 million. Um, Broward had nine districts. Palm Beach had seven districts. And, uh, um, and this Karen Jarosh, who made these comments, um, uh, uh, mentioned the possibility of, of nine member districts. The thing that makes sense to me is that we're catching Hillsborough at a point in time where if you looked at some of the other information that was in there, um, we had roughly a 17 and a half percent population change since 2010. That's 2010 to 2019. That makes us the greatest population change of those top four of those top four. So while there are greater populations than the other counties, we're changing faster. And the way I see it is that we're not planning for today, we're planning for the future. And uh, um, the other fact about this that I've mentioned before, but, but I'm, I'm trying to encapsulate this um, uh, so you can see my thought process is that Hillsborough is odd in that we're shaped around Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay causes some unique geometric aspects of the configuration of our county. And that doesn't make it very easy to do compact uh, districts. And, and I only point that out because that one also speaks to the division and, and the number of, of divisions of districts. 
and lastly, I want to I want to say to you that um, in trying to to look at reasons for more or less um, uh, member districts, um, I looked at the planning areas for Hillsborough County, and and the planning commission has those divided out into 19 planning areas. And again, that number doesn't relate directly to anything, but if you think about those 19 planning areas. Um, it's a lot more than seven or nine. And so you can see that uh, um, trying to consolidate is, a, is an effort in and of itself. I think this information is pointing to single member districts for Hillsborough County um, that we have been given the opportunity to plan for in the future. And because of everything I just said, I think that, uh, that nine member districts are, uh, are looking Appropriate as established by Karen Jorash in her uh, in her uh, in her public comment. So there you go. That's what I have uh, for you. And uh, and thanks for hearing that. It'd be interested in in comments. Thank you. Um, I have uh, Robin, Ms. Delaverne. You're recognized. Okay. I just have to get myself off mute. Um, I I agree with what Jamie has said. One of the things that really hit me was looking at the large counties, and Hillsborough's one of them, is we're the only one that has a mixed um, districts. Everybody else is single district. And when you look at somebody trying to represent 1.4 million people, it's pretty tough to really get to where your, you know, what your constituents want and really represent them. So I'm very supportive of looking at um, moving to single districts and potentially um, you know, whether it's seven or nine, I'm not sure what the, the magic number is, but I do think we should seriously consider going to single member districts. We're sort of the outlier. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Delavern. Do you have anything else? Not yet. Not right now. All right. Thank you. Dr. Fox, I see you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm looking at the list, and it seems that uh, Duval is mixed, and uh, Pinellas is mixed, and of course Volusia is much smaller, and they're also mixed. So there's a few that are still mixed, but I I think that um, before the discussion goes any further, that we should look at what's wrong with what we have now. In other words, uh, what is it that we're trying to fix, and uh, Jamie and Robin, I, I got your points about um, increasing population and, and numbers and how difficult um, it is to, to have uh, contiguous uh, districts. But I worry about the um, priorities of individual districts pitted against those of the entire county. So. Um, you know, we, we really do have some um, overreaching, overarching umbrella type priorities, whereas uh, some of the smaller areas would have some things of their own that they'd be interested in. That's why I think what we have is a pretty good mix. In other words, I, I'm very willing to look at single member districts, but I first want to know why what we have now isn't working well enough for us. I, I don't see that yet. Oops, sorry. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fox. I'll just ask if you're done speaking to make sure you take your hand down. I'm just trying to keep the order. Uh, I see Ms. Stewart, you're recognized. <laughs> you're on mute, Ms. Stewart. Back. Now we have you. Oh, okay. Um, I can't find it instantly here. It's probably in my information. Maybe Mary Helen can tell me which of the documents tells us if they have county mayors. Um, I believe at this point, it's um, orange kind of has a hybrid mayor. Uh, Miami-Dade has a mayor. So I think those are the ones that, that you might want to look to. Broward does. They just elect one of yeah. the commissioners to take a turn as a mayor. What happens when you get these larger county commissions, in my experience, has been that they elect a mayor and the mayor gets to do trot around. It's an enhanced 
chairman of the board. And the other thing that I have noticed in my experience is that then they began trading horses. In Miami Day, <clears throat> in Miami Day, they actually trade money. Every commissioner gets a portion, a pot. And I know they're an outlier there in the Constitution, but um, it leads to terrible things, single member districts. <clears throat> If you can't get it one way, you go horse trade with another commissioner. It just it pervades the entire process, in my opinion. That's all I have to say about that at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. And I'm just looking, um, Ms. Delavert, I see your hand. I couldn't tell whether it was up or down. I do have one more comment, and then I, now I know that's what it looks like when it's up. So I'll actually okay. put it down. Yeah, you're recognized now. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not completely opposed to the mix, but I feel like the only having four single um, member districts with this many people, even those single member districts, it's hard for them to really represent their full district. The districts are so big and so. Um, varied that I feel like it needs to be, we need to, even if we look at a mix, we need to look at how many and single districts we have so they can be more um, concise, more so the, that the um, commissioners really can get to know their um, constituents. That's all I have right now. Thank you, Ms. Delavert. Uh, Mr. Johnson. You're recognized. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I had a couple of points I wanted to be able to try and hit. Uh, first is, uh, I, I think I really like the idea of the, the single member districts only because of the fact that it really is going to allow, I think, a commissioner to be able to get, have an opportunity to be able to be around their constituents a little bit more to where I think that really kind of it hamstrings a county-wide position only because of the uh, what the points that have already been made uh, regarding the uh, the size of the county, the way the districts are set up, uh, and one of, and Miss Stewart actually made a comment that I was kind of kind of was interested at uh, regarding the with single member districts allowing the ability to horse trade and to I guess uh, for the lack of uh, better terms to, I guess, to cut deals uh, to be able to help their districts. And I was kind of, I was interested with the the, the three former members of the legislature that we uh, currently have on the board. I'd really be kind of interested to be able to see what their thoughts are when the way I look at it, if you just kind of extrapolate it out, it would be just a smaller version of a legislature at that point where, you know, each, each member has the responsibility to take care of their district, the, you know, in their what they see is the best way to be able to do it. And if, uh, you know, there are certain uh, deals that can be made to be able to help out each other's district, you know, I think that's, you know, being able to compromise with others, I think is, you know, maybe that actually helps us out uh, in some ways. And I'll, I'll stop for, for right now, Mr. Chair. I may come back in a minute. Okay. And Ms. Berry, I see your hand, you're recognized. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm listening to the conversation in regards to the single member districts. So my question is, uh, will there be equity amongst the different districts for minorities? Uh, where would minorities have representation amongst these nine seats? That's my question. <laughs> Ms. Ferris, I think you'd probably best capable of answering that question for us. Sure, there are federal guidelines on how to redistrict. One man, one vote, equal population as much as you can get. So that process would occur when redistricting occurred, depending on if you want seven or nine single member districts or whatever the charter review board comes up with. So there are federal guidelines on minority representation that would come into play. Ms. Berry, you're muted again. Are you Oh, sorry. <laughs> so my question is, uh, why does it make sense for us to reduce the voting power of our public to from four votes to just pretty much one vote? Is that correct? Is that what we're 
trying to do? How do we qualify this? Yeah. Okay. Well, if I may, the current structure allows every voter to uh, vote for a majority of the board. If you go to single member districts, then every voter will vote for their own district commissioner. Sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I, I think the sound is kind of distorted. Can you repeat that? Absolutely. Uh, the current uh, mix of districts allows every voter to vote for a majority of the board. If you go to single member districts, that's four commissioners. If you go to single member districts, then the voters will vote for their own district commissioner. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Berry. I have Ms. Stewart. You're recognized. Yes, can, am I not muted? You, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I have a response to Mr. Johnson um, when he said uh, the legislative process. One key difference is that the Board of County Commissioners is bound by the public records law. The legislature is not. They can wheel and deal and do whatever they want. The board is not supposed to do that outside of a public meeting. And I um, am familiar with an occurrence in um, Lee County where a major highway ran through a subdivision because the builders built on the major road on either side. And so to the detriment of the entire county, they bowed to a single member district and moved a major highway so it wouldn't go through the subdivision. That's what happens with single member districts. And Ms. Berry, you are absolutely right. You give up the majority vote on the commission. You have only one. And if you don't like the candidates that are running for that one, you don't have another commissioner to go talk to. If you have four to choose from, you're bound to agree with somebody on something. That's all I've got to say for the moment. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Too late? <laughs> uh, no, you're good. I think an, a, an excellent exercise for us, and Mary Helen, you may agree or disagree, would be to bring out some of those maps from the last redistricting exercise and let people see how difficult it is to cut up the county into districts. What you and I think of as a single member district is not gonna be the same as what our next door neighbor sees. So that might be a way for us to envision what would happen in the county. Thank you. I would I would be happy to provide that information and all the maps that were looked at. Thank you. All right, we have Representative Fig and then on deck, Representative Shaw. You're on mute, Representative. Okay. Now, okay. I have a question for Mary Helen, and I have a, a response to Mr. Johnson too, but uh, I wish you'd take my question first, which is, I know that, Hills, that the Voting Rights Act has it's more or less expired. So, uh, and this is to Ms. Berry's question earlier about equal representation for, min for minorities but doesn't Hillsborough County still ha undergo some sort of scrutiny as a result of having been a Voting Rights Act County? Yeah, let me, let me address that. Uh, back in 1972, the reason that Hillsborough County was subject to preclearance is that we had a certain percentage of Spanish voters and did not print our ballots in Spanish and English. It wasn't because of past discrimination. Some years ago, there was a challenge because the formula to trigger that was very, very, very old. So the formula went away, even though we're still subject to what we call Section 5 preclearance. There's also another section in the Voting Rights Act about Section 2, and that is anti-retrogression. Um, and I don't want to get too in the weeds with it, but we would still be subject to that. Oh, good. Thank you for responding. I thought that we were. Uh, in regard to Mr. Johnson's statement about he'd be interested in legislative perspective, I was elected in 82, which is the first year that we had single member districts in the legislature. 
And I want to say that without single member districts, I probably would have not gotten elected because at that time, the multi-member district that was all of the unincorporated part of the county, and it would have been very difficult for a woman to win in South and East County. As you know, by the fact that we have at large uh, members on the county commissioners, it's possible for a woman to get elected at large. We have three of them uh, in Hillsborough County. What I found as a legislator is that uh, some legislators, not all, but some, can be very parochial. We had, uh, in the olden days, we had eight House members and three Senate senators, and all there, most of it, we, we went outside the boundary a little bit, but all of us were basically within Hillsborough County. One of those legislators who shall remain unnamed, two of those legislators who shall remain unnamed, were very parochial. They didn't care about Tampa General Hospital, which was a major issue for Hillsborough County at that time, and still is. They didn't care about the anything that happened in the city of Tampa, Tampa Bay, none of that was their interest. They only cared about their area. And that's a real problem with single member districts, the parochialism that you have among the legislators. And that's all I'll say about that. Thank you, Representative. Representative Shaw, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm really not convinced either way yet because I'm hearing good things on, on both sides. Um, but I, I do have to stay for Ms. Stewart. Like, I, I can find bad examples from any form of government here in Florida, unfortunately. So if I wanted to give you horror stories about how anything's horrible, I could find some. But um, I, I would. I think I might be in favor of increasing the number of single member districts and keeping some at large seats as well. That's where I think I'm starting to lean towards as I'm listening to everybody speak. And Ms. Barry brings up a good point. I wouldn't approve anything until I saw the what kind of maps we would be looking at and the representation, the minority representation especially. I wouldn't be prepared to approve anything until I saw that too. But this is a real good discussion because I thought I was somewhere until I started listening to the debate. So I appreciate that. And and I'll let uh, Representative Fig accurately describe the legislature, so I'll leave that to her. My experience was much the same. If you take me out to a drink, I'll actually name the ones, though, uh, after coronavirus leaves. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Uh, You're on. I saw your hand. Ms. Yates? My questions were already brought up by other people, so I put my hand down. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, you're recognized. Oh, quickly, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to respond to uh, Ms. Stewart and uh, the example that she had. And I, I guess, and I wanted to be able to make sure that, uh, you know, I was, I was assuming that uh, everybody would be, you know, abiding by the law and abiding by all the different, uh, you know, public records and uh, meeting requirements uh, that are that are needed to be uh, abided by in a, in a public meeting. I'm sure that, you know, during your time in the county, you've seen the horse training go back and forth actually at the dais. And I you know would know, I would hope that that wasn't happening behind closed doors. Uh, so, but I, I appreciate the perspective there. Uh, I, I did also want to make one quick point um, or kind of follow up on something that uh, Ms. Barry had mentioned about uh, the diversity uh, element of things. And I think that's where we might have with the single members, the single member districts, I think that really allows us to be able to uh, make sure that, you know, the I mean, with Hillsborough County being as big as it is, you know, the, the diversity within the county, I think would be uh, better reflected with those single member districts. And uh, and then maybe later on, if we do end up talking more about uh, some of the items that are required through the Voting Rights Act, uh, I'd be kind of interested to see whether or not, you know, does that require any more than just what we have right now or not? Uh, and finally, uh, having worked at the county the last time that there was a redistricting process, uh, I, I would definitely want to be able to have everybody see how the, the map making process works because uh, that that's a an interesting experience to say the least. So uh, that, that's all I've got, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scarola. You're recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Oh, wait, Chairman. One, one, one moment, Mr. Carolla. I see uh, Mary Hallett has her hand up, and I don't want her to lose this. Or she has a point. Somebody knows that. Ms. Ferris, you're recognized. Yes. yes. When we did the redistricting in 2011 and 2001, um, actually, well, 2011 specifically, we have a CD, which was our submission to the voting rights to the Justice Department. I'd be happy to provide that to the members. It has a lot of information, all the maps, all the meetings, all the public comment cards. And so you truly get to see what the process was. So I think it would be helpful if I could provide that to each of the Charter Review Board members. Oh, good, good. That would be excellent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Scarola and then Ms. Yates. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, everybody. Um, your comments are all appreciated. Um, uh, I see the pluses and minuses um, that were mentioned. But I do want to just make an empirical note of what is going on today that is, I consider to be of great importance. And that is, as an example, Apollo Beach, Gibsonton is currently represented out of South Tampa. Sun City Center, Waimama, currently represented out of Northeast Hillsborough County. And we've got the fastest growing end of the county right now. That can't possibly be right. And it's gonna need more representation. And that's a that's a powerful driving fact. And I and I think uh, you know, since since this board meets once every five years, um, I don't think it can be left unsaid. Um, and having said that, the the um, uh, the questions about map making and so forth I think are important, but I don't. I think that it can only be tackled in an incremental um, process, and so it's 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 just my thought that uh, our first step here is considering this uh, um, this issue of the member districts, and, and not and, and while not focusing on the issue of how they actually get uh, or or um, what the districts actually look like, that would um, overly complicate it. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yates. You recognize. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of comments, really. One, I had to respectfully disagree with um, something Mr. Johnson just said. You mentioned, and please correct me if I'm mis kind of characterizing what you said. You said something along the lines of single member districts tend to be more reflective of their community or in and of itself, and that maybe their representation would be the same. I would very much disagree with that. And I think it kind of goes back to Ms. Berry's point that if you only have one person to potentially vote for, that could be a big problem for certain communities. Whereas at large, you have the opportunity to have other representation for your community if perhaps your candidate or the candidates are not reflective of the community. I think that's an issue that I'm really thinking about in this um, consideration. And then the second thing um, Ms. Stewart brought up about um, everyone kind of thinking for themselves in these single member districts and everyone just kind of fighting for themselves and trading horses, I think was the comment. Um, we've had some interesting, um, I don't want to say evidence of that, but notes of that when we look at just the EPG discussions over the last few months. And that every person on there has different constituents and it's very much what is good for me instead of what's good for all. And I think that's been a really, really good um, experiment as to maybe how this could go. That's Those are just a few things that I've been thinking about as we have this discussion that I think are really important to note that's been going on right now in our own community. That's all I have. Thank you. So folks, I, I don't see anybody else's hands at this point. And I, I have to tell you, um, well, I do see Ms. Stewart. Um, Ms. Stewart, you're recognized. Don't let me interrupt your thought process. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Um, you know, I, I, all of these arguments have been very, very good tonight. And I do, you know, I came in here thinking, okay, we're at seven, which is very similar to where Palm Beach is, according to the information. Um, but our growth is, is much faster than Palm Beach is at this point. And I think the point that we are looking at a five-year situation before this board could actually meet again and actually do something about this before the 22 redistricting. I think this is a very important issue for us to kind of tackle at this time. Um, I will say that what we're seeing with the growth, um, seven may not cut it. 
Um, I like the idea of going to nine. I think it's more representative for the size of our county. Um, I will throw it out there that I am not a fan of the county mayor concept that we see in Orange or even the Broward County mayor system where they elect a county commissioner. I think in a county uh, this large and growing, that's too much power to put in one person's hands. We also have a county administrator that we take a lot of the executive functions are under her office at this point in time. And I think it should stay that way. So I, I just want to throw my opinion out there. Um, I've had conversations with staff about the minority access seat. And I think as the districts continue to change, especially within the city of Tampa, what you're going to see is the minority population is going to move away from it where it currently is and further out into the county. And so it's going to be even more difficult to create a minority access mm -hmm. seat, but we all recognize the importance of having a minority voice on the county commission, particularly as it relates to African Americans. That seat, uh, the district three seat, has only been in place since 1985. And that's not a very long time because that's in, in my lifetime. Um, and I like to think I'm not that old. But um, with that said, when you look at the electoral politics of the county, you have not had an African American, just one rather, elected countywide in Hillsborough County. So we haven't made the progress that we'd like to think that we have made. Um, and thank God for women, because we have four women currently elected to the county commission of, of mo both parties. So we've made progress in that area, but in terms of minority access, particularly African Americans, we just haven't seen it yet. I do believe that day is coming. So I had assurances from the staff that because of the way the laws are written, the federal laws, we won't see retrogression in any map creation you have to have a minority access seat. And in my opinion, going to nine, there may be an opportunity to even create a Hispanic access seat, potentially. I don't know, because I'm not a map drawer, it's just conversations that we've had. So, you know, I just want to throw my two cents out there that I do believe we should be moving, looking at moving from seven to nine. Whether or not that should be single member districts or a hybrid is still up for debate in my mind. Um, as a former legislator, I will say, that the rules are different for the elected officials in Tallahassee than they are in local government. But the, my main concern is just ensuring that there's minority representation on the board and that the people are actually served. Um, truly, right now, if you ask the average constituent who their representative is on the county commission, they're gonna tell you the name of a single member person. They're not gonna tell you the at-large folks. Um, I think if you spoke to uh, Commissioner Miller, uh, the calls that come into his district, particularly from my community, um, they're not coming from people all over. They're just coming from his district because they believe he's their commissioner. And that's unfortunate because the other three at-large commissioners don't get the calls, and they should. So while the system in theory should work, it doesn't always for the constituents. So that's my two cents. Um, Ms. Stewart, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, Mr. Scarola seems not interested in seeing the maps, but I think it's important to show how very diverse our county is. And when you see how difficult it is to draw a single member district for a minority, if you will recall in the last charter review, we had a huge uh, public interest in drawing a minority Hispanic district. So they wanted a single member district for Hispanics. There is no focus group for Hispanics. They don't all live in one place. They're all over the county. And more and more, the African-American community is widely dispersed. And I think as the city of Tampa and downtown grows, it's going to shift more, as you had earlier said. So I think seeing some of the maps, even if they're just specific to the ethnic dispersion in our county, would be useful in the discussion so you can see what is attainable and what is beyond the pale. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. And she represented Fig and then Mr. Skrull. You're recognized. Thank you very much. Mr. Narain, uh, Mr. Chairman, it is one of my goals to that if we approach this subject and actually do something about re reapportionment in some manner, not reapportionment, redistricting, excuse me. Uh, that we do so in a manner that won't harm the minority districts that we presently have. Under the present system, I think we all know or should know that the reason we have a gerrymandered District 1 is to hold harmless District 3. 
and we'd like to create something that continues to have a minority black district in Hillsborough County. I think that's of utmost importance to our citizens who live in our county. That's Thank you, Representative. And Mr. Scarola, you're recognized. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And maybe um, this would be a question for Mary Helen, um, but I'd like to, to kind of now refocus for a second on process because I'm losing track a little bit of where we could actually head with this, uh, depending on the sentiment, of course, of the board. But uh, um, am I right that, that anything that we do would require two public hearings uh, to change the charter? And so I'm, uh, it's a little fuzzy to me right now about timing, you know, what things would have to happen. Could we get some insight into that? Mr. Chair, this is Beth. Mary Helen's having some connection issues, so she should be back on in the next few minutes. No problem. Okay. I did and, ask and, that uh, process question. Oh, okay. And I, you know, I'll go ahead and, and step out there in, in my one-on-one -on -one with um, both Mary Helen and Elizabeth last week. The process does require for anything we were to want to change, um, it does require two public meetings before it could be put towards the put on the ballot. And at this particular time, it would have those two public meetings would have to happen before the August primary. The language has to be into the supervisor of elections office by the day after the August primary in order to make the November ballot to be voted upon. Now that's for 2020. We do have the option of waiting until reapportionment and then kicking the can until 22. And according to our rules, we could have any called meetings that we needed to, if, to to put this in front of the public. That would be up to, you know, us as a board. Ed, may I uh, may I uh, go ahead and speak again? Oh yes, please. Yeah, I, I'm I'm almost thinking that because and, and listen, this board couldn't have possibly planned on a worldwide pandemic um, uh, to uh, do its scheduling, but. But uh, um, because of the short time, I wonder if we ought to um, set public hearings in anticipation of making a move, um, knowing that it's possible that we may not be able to make the move and if we have to cancel meetings, we cancel them. But uh, it seems like it'd be a good idea to set ourselves up to be able to do something other than to just talk about it for now. I think that's something we'll need to take to a vote, but let's have uh, Ms. Ferris come back on and actually sign off or disagree with what I just said. So, you know, I don't want to say something and it's out of turn. So she'll come in and validate that and then we'll, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, this is, oh, she validated everything by email. She's, she's able to email me and she validated everything by email. Oh, okay. Oh, this is different. You gotta, you gotta forgive me here. Um, so she's validating what I, she's validated what I said by email. Yeah, she's emailing about her technology trouble and did so, um, you know, agreed with what you stated. For transparency purposes, do you mind sharing the email like on your screen? I just want people to be comfortable. Oh, she should be back on in the next moment, but. Um, oh, okay, she's coming back. She's on. All right, good, we're good. She's back, she just popped up. I apologize for that. Somehow I got knocked off. Um, the last that I heard was a timing issue, which I would like to address. It's correct. Um, you have the opportunity, uh, similar to the 2010 Charter Review Board, to put something on the ballot in 2020 and also in 2022. And the chair was correct that uh, Craig Latimer needs, we start doing the general election ballot actually the night of the primary. So that would be the last date that we could do this, which is basically about six weeks away. So we would have to have the two public hearings. Um, I need the time to draft um, the document, which I will do as soon as I can. So that is, that's the timing we're looking at. Mary Ellen, is there a, a time frame between public hearings that has to occur? Is there a time lag? No, the charter, the charter just says it has two public hearings. Um, there might be some, 
concern if we had two really close public meetings on short notice. Uh, that's just, uh, you know, that's just an issue that you can decide on from a policy standpoint. We certainly can do it if we move quickly, if the board wants to go that way. Also, let me just mention, it only takes a majority to direct me to draft the um, document, but it does take 10 votes for it to go forward. This is Scolari, do you have any further questions? Um, no, no, thank you, I appreciate it though. All right, Ms. Delaverne, you're recognized. Yeah, I have two questions. One for Mary Hunt, does the, do the public hearings have to be where everybody, like at the convention center and be in person or can they be um, like this? At this point, uh, we would probably do it virtually. I don't see that the county uh, is going to be open. I don't know about the availability of the convention center. Uh, that may be an option, but the logistics in doing that, we've been planning for several months just to have a land use meeting, and that's not gonna occur until mid-August, and we're still working out the kinks on that. So I think at this point, it would probably be a virtual meeting. Okay, I mean, I definitely agree it should be virtual. I just wanted to make sure that it could be. And then the other thing is, do we, in order to have the uh, public hearing, do we have to, are we having it to get feedback of, or considering, you know, changing from, you know, the number of districts and different things and getting their feedback, or do we have to say, this is what we're looking to put out, put on the ballot? I just need some clarification. Sure, typically what happens is I will get direction from the board, um, I will draft the document, and then um, if it meets the approval of the board, we set it for public hearing. Okay, but, but does the document have to be specific of what would go on the ballot? I would, I would recommend doing that. If you wanted alternative proposals, I could try to get that together. Um, and then there would be a choice of one or the other. But I think the public needs to have the document drafted. In this case, it's a resolution rather than an ordinance that the board does. Uh, but the, the document needs to be drafted so the public can see the exact language of what you're considering, unless you wanted to do a work top, workshop type setting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Dr. Fox, you're recognized. Uh, yes, I, I, I think you started to answer, Mary Helen, but let me um, ask it anyway. Um, have we, as Hillsborough County, had any large public meetings virtually? since this all began? Yes, we've had Board of County Commissioners meetings and we've had EPG meetings. Those are the largest ones that we've done virtually. And what has been the attendance from the public? At EPG, there's a handful of uh, public comments at the board meetings, there's a handful. Uh, it really depends on what's on the agenda, uh, but the public has participated. And we advertise those or how do they get the word? We send out a notice that has step-by-step um, -step instructions to the public as to how they sign up for public comment and the uh, link to do so. Okay, and when you say sent out, how, who do you send that to? It's, it's published on the county website. Um, I could get with communications if, if the board would like to have some kind of blast uh, public notice sent out. I mean, there's some things that we could do to do as much as we can for the notice. But up to this point, it's been passive. The notices have been kind of a passive effort on the county's part, right? Well, we we said we don't do anything more or less than what we normally did, right. uh, except that people know to come down to the board meeting in person. You know, where right. in, in this case it's done virtually. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Representative Shaw, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm, uh, unless I can be convinced otherwise, I think I need to see maps before I'm willing to go to the final approval of a motion either way. I think I'm where you are. I tend to think nine single member districts and some at larges is where I'm going to end up. But even if that motion was made today, I'm not sure I'm comfortable voting in the affirmative if I don't if I don't at least see some map 
context or background. That's just where I am personally. I have uh, Representative Fig and Mr. Scalera. Scarola, excuse me. Okay. We can hear you. Uh, I think that I can be heard. Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm in agreement that we don't, we're in an area we don't know what we're talking about here. That is to say, we don't know if we added two more members or three more members or five more members, what that would actually look like in terms of could we have a minority African American district in Hillsborough County? And so we don't necessarily need a map, but we certainly need a precinct level uh, information. Does the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission uh, have the data that uh, is the census? projections for 2018 is my one of the questions. In other words, would we have up-to-date numbers that we could look at that would make sense to us? And can we do that in such a manner that would fit with a timetable that we have to abide by? I don't know who's on the board that can speak to that or whether there's any staff that can speak to that. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might, this is Mary Helen. I can reach out yes, to the please. Planning Commission. I, I'm not sure how up-to-date their numbers are. Uh, and when we talk about seeing maps, we would need to get our GIS folks to just run numbers in equal population, dividing it into seven or nine or whichever the board would like to see. Representative Fink, any other questions? Any additional questions? I'm sorry. Okay. All right, Mr. Scarola. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the board members, I, yes, far be it for me to think that we could solve this problem uh, tonight. Uh, however, it doesn't mean we can't set up uh, potential hearing dates um, to hear information with respect to the issue. And uh, w with respect to the comments about the African-American community, I think we should get it sh straight from the source. I mean, I would ask maybe that we invite uh, Commissioner Miller in to, to talk about it. I think he probably has uh, good information uh, that would assist with this. Um, so, you know, given the choice, I would say let's let's go ahead and set two meetings, and uh, and if you're in agreement, invite Commissioner Miller in to talk about it. Well, um, I I don't want to exert my will on the board. Um, I think that having Commissioner come in is a is a great idea. Um, one of the other things I'd like to throw out there is I think what we're saying. Because I don't want us to get too deep into the, the weeds. The commissioners still have the ability to create the maps. That is going to always be their responsibility. Um, they can take input from whatever agencies they decide to talk to, but this body would not be able to do that. What this body can do, however, is ask staff to create language um, that would show either nine single member districts or nine mixed districts or seven single member districts, depending on what the pleasure of this board is tonight. Um, I'm not gonna speak for everybody. I, I'm in favor of seeing uh, nine and, and seeing the language for what nine single member or nine mixed use districts would look like from staff. And that's ultimately what we would be putting in front of the public to decide upon. And then the commissioners would be the ones with the responsibility of drawing the maps. So I, I do, and, and the safeguard for District 3, let's remember, is that the federal law prohibits any map from getting drawn that would create any type of retrogression. So there will be a minority access seat, no matter what language we decide to, to move forward if we were to have those two hearings once staff provides that. So my suggestion, and it's only a suggestion at this point, is that we get a motion instructing staff to craft language for us, and that's what we would put in front for public hearings for the community, the Hillsborough community to decide if they want to move forward. We we shouldn't really be touching the maps component. 
Um, I see uh, Mr. Johnson, you're recognized. Well, since Mr. Chair, since you all uh, just kind of, I guess, put that up on a, a T for us to be able to go ahead and start talking about, I guess I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and start make the motion then. So at least we can start the process of, you know, getting a vote if we need to. And I got and Mary Helen, if I'll make sure I try and make this as good as possible as far as the motion, I'll, I'll make a motion I'll, to direct staff to bring a proposal that would create nine single member districts. I'll, I'll, I guess for us to be able to put on the 2020 ballot. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second that motion. Okay. We have a motion that's been properly seconded. Is there any debate? Representative Sig, you're recognized. Um, I think I'll pass. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Fox, you're recognized. Uh, yes, Mr. Johnson, I just want to make sure I understand your motion. It's solely for nine single member districts. Can you hear me? Mr. Chair, can, oh, sorry, but forced to yeah. have it going through the chair. I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it would be nine single member districts. Yes. Okay, and so if if we are still, I uh, personally am still um, weighing the options. So if I also want to look at um, nine representatives with, let's say, four at large and five single member, um, we would have to have a second motion then to have that language brought forward. Is that what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. You're recognized, Mr. Johnson, to answer. Uh, my, my thought would be, and this may be more of a Mary Helen question, is I think that it would require a second motion. But that being said, if I guess if there were two different motions, if they were passed favorably, that would allow Mary Helen to be able to at least start working on a version of a motion, or I'm sorry, a version of a all, all a proclamation for us to be able to consider. So it would. So let's say the one that I just made the motion for, I, if that passed favorably, we would have that option. Or if you decided you wanted to be able to make a motion, however you wanted to word it, we would be able to have a second option if that passed favorably as well. And again, that may be more of a Mary Helen jump in and save me kind of a moment. <laughs> no, I would, I would prefer it to be two different motions so that everybody can just vote on a specific uh, configuration of the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Is there anyone with any other questions or comments in debate? I don't see hands. Oh, Ms. Delavert, you're recognized. I just want some clarification for what Mary Helen said. Did she say she would prefer there be two separate motions that are voted on and she brings then two of them to us and then we decide which it is? Or did she say she wanted just one? Uh, just she said separate motions. That's but correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, just so that you vote on one idea if you want single member versus the mixed districts, uh, I think it would be better to do it what we call ad seriatim so that you vote on each one independently. So what, what happens if they both pass? Then what I would do is have two different versions. Uh, which might take a little time to, to get those together, but we can always put the concept out there for um, if we need to have a special meeting at a charter review board without all the transitional language, which takes some time to draft. It would just be the concept of this is what the language would be for, for nine single member and conversely, or the alternative, uh, what a fight force um, would look like. Any further questions, Ms. Deliver? Thank you. Anyone else with any questions? Mr. Representative Shaw, the floor is yours. Hey, I'm sorry to do this. Can you restate the exact motion uh, one more time? I'm sorry, thank you. 
Mr. Chair, I'll go, I'll go ahead and restate that quickly. And I'll try and I'll say it as, I, I think the way I said it originally was I'll, I, I would propose that we, that to direct staff to, I'll create a proclamation or I'll, or a proposal for nine single member districts. Representative Sean, did you have a follow up? Uh, I, so I, that means I would assume we would remain with the same number of at large districts under your motion. Never. No. Um, my uh, interpretation is we would increase the number to nine uh, individual districts per Mr. Johnson's motion. And what was asked uh, yes. by Dr. Fox is whether we could, whether it could also be a second motion that instructs staff to bring back nine mixed use districts as uh -huh. well. Okay, thanks. And, and Mr. Chip, that motion, and, and thank you. And that was, that was the intent of the motion was to be able to have nine single member districts with no at large. And I don't, if, if I need to be able to make, if you want me to clarify that within the motion, I'll be happy to. Yes. Please, for the record. Okay, then, then I'm going to number three on the on the motion. Uh, I would like to direct staff to create a all proposal creating nine single member districts with no at large districts. Period. All right, Mr. Scarola, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, any interest on your part in uh, in specifying a time frame? Um, a, 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 can we have a regular um, uh, charter review board meeting earlier than our next planned charter review board? That's within our rules. Uh, we could have a special call meeting at any time. That's correct. Ah, okay. All right. That's good, Mr. Johnson. Uh, my intent would be to have it at the, or have a proposal by the next meeting. And again, if I need to amend the motion, I, I will continually, I'll, I'll piecemeal that motion if you need me to, to be able to keep on adding on. But yes, the the intent was to be able to have the uh, the next, at the next meeting, have a proposal uh, be presented to us by staff. So we would be able to take a look at that. Because then that would, Mary Ellen, correct me if I'm wrong here, would Mary, if we had it at the next meeting, we would have one more opportunity to be able to create a, or either move the next meeting before the primary. As long as we had that second meeting, we'd be able to uh, possibly look, look at it again, correct? That's correct. I think the next charter review board meeting is August 4th. That's correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, okay. That's going up pretty close to uh, the deadline for submitting the language if you want it to go on 2020. If you want it to go on 2022, we do have a lot more time to go through this process, but that's really up to the board to decide. Uh, Mayor Helen, let me, let me jump Chair. in there. Um, I was under the impression that you had to know what you were proposing before you could have your two public meetings because you would have had to have published it. Published it. Is that wrong? Because if that's the case, then I'm not as concerned. Um, if it is, then we need to have a special meeting, look at the language, and then set two public meetings. Yeah, that's correct. I would suggest if you want to go to nine, that I give you the language, you, you talk about the language, and that we have a resolution prepared uh, so that the public can see the actual resolution before we have the public hearing. Hearings, too, a plural. So, correct. so that leaves ex extremely little time. Um, and I'm just saying, but, um, you know, maybe a special meeting on July 20th. I'm sorry, that won't work. Um, Mary Helen, how long would you need to, to propose it? Uh, drafting, <laughs> drafting the change to um, the language in Article 4 of the Charter does not take time. What really takes time is the transition schedule, where we have to make sure we don't um, kick somebody out of office, for instance, Commissioner Kemp is going to be, uh, she's up in 2020. So you just have to be careful about that language. Um, so, I mean, I can do the conceptual stuff, and then certainly if the Charter Review Board decides on which way they want to go, then I can prepare the other part of the resolution. Could we have a special meeting on the, uh, 
on July 13th, Mr. Chairman? Um, uh, pretty much, I think we'd have to look at everybody's schedules and, and pretty much call that. Um, but I want to deal with just the motion that's on the floor right now before we get into looking at any calendars. I also get the sense that if this motion is to pass, there will be another motion and probably a second asking for nine uh, mixed use districts as well. So with that said, if that were to occur, that means the next meeting that we had, whether it was a special meeting or on time, would probably be pretty lengthy because we're gonna have a debate about those two different formats and we'd have to choose one in order to have those two public meetings before the August 18th uh, ballot deadline. So we're saying the same thing. I just want to be clear that should Mr. Johnson's motion pass, I get a sense that there's going to be another motion asking for nine, but in a different format that we'll be deciding at the very next meeting. Between, we'll be having two proposals potentially to decide. That's my feel. But for right now, let's just stick to the motion that's in front of us, which is the motion from Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, did you have anything else to add? I see Dr. Fox's hand. I don't have anything else to add, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Dr. Fox, you recognize? You're on mute. Sorry, um, I should have said this earlier in our discussion, but um, it's too late. We need to deal with this motion. But after this motion, I would just like for you, Mr. Chair, to just poll the, the members of the committee and see how comfortable we are with this timeline. This is a very substantial move that we'll be making. I think it's important. I think it's something that um, we all will be very proud of uh, once we uh, get it done one way or the other, because we will have done our research and we will have uh, given it good thought and we will have heard from both um, people at the county level and from citizens about how they feel about this. I'm very concerned that six weeks is um, not a timeline in which we can do a good job on this. And I hate just as much the fact that it would take two more years to get it done. So um, we're really between a rock and a hard place. And after we uh, vote this motion up or down, um, if we could just have a two minute conversation about the timing and uh, see how everyone feels about it. Thank you. Thank you for that input. All right, Mr. Johnson, I see your hand. Just to close on the motion. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll wait my colleagues. Okay. Uh, I see no other comment. Are you ready for the question? We're going to take a roll call vote on the motion uh, to instruct staff to create language for nine single member districts with no at large. It's been made and properly seconded. We're going to turn it over to the clerk for the vote. Good evening, Narain. Yes. Barry? Yes. Bryant? Yes. Delaverne? Delaverne? Can you hear me? Yes. Big? No. Fox? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Mueller? Yes. Garola? Yes. Shaw? No. Stewart? No. Thrower? Yes. Wood? Yes. Yates. No. Motion carried 10 to 4. Members Fig, Shaw, Stewart, and Yates voted no. All right. Are there any other motions on the floor?
Ms. Bryant, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to propose a motion that we ask legal counsel to submit language to the board for an increase to nine members, including uh, five single district and uh, four at-large seats. I, I would All right, you heard the motion. Second is there a motion. second? I see Ms. Yates with a second. All right, is there any discussion? Representative Fig, I see your hand still. Uh, no, I want to take my hand down. Okay. It looks like the board is clear. Are you ready for the question? Yes. I will turn it over to the clerk. Uh, the motion is to instruct staff to create language that could possibly develop nine member, a nine member commission with five single members and four at large. It has been made and properly seconded. We're ready for the question. Narain? Yes. Barry? Yes. Bryant? Yes. Delaverne? Yes. Big? Yes. Fox? Yes. Johnson? Johnson? No. Mueller? Yes. Garola? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Thrower? Yes. Wood? Yes. Yates? Yes. Motion carried 13 to one, uh, member Johnson voted no. Okay, thank you members. I'd like to have, take that opportunity, Dr. Fox mentioned us having a poll about the timing. Um, let's, let's have a very, just a quick discussion. I mean, July is a month where I know people tend to travel, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. So um, we have by our rules, the opportunity to call a special meeting um, I want to be clear that I don't want to overburden staff, but in the conversations I've had with them regarding this possibility, they have language from the past that they have used that they should be able to bring this um, pretty quickly back in front of us if we want to have a meeting sometime in the middle of July. Um, with that said, I don't want to speak for staff, so uh, Mary Helen and Elizabeth, um, do you mind giving us what your thoughts are with these two directives? what you believe that timeline looks like for you all to have something that the, the board can evaluate and discuss? Yeah, this is Mary Helen. Um, I can do the language to for both these different proposals very quickly. As I mentioned, it's the transition schedule that takes some time. So I think for the purposes of discussion and uh, deciding which plan you want to go with, I can have that very quickly. And then once I get direction on which one you want to go, I can do the additional uh, drafting for the transition schedule. Understood. Are there any questions from anyone? Okay, I see a few hands. I see Dr. Fox and then Representative Fig and Mr. Scarola. Um, Mr. Chair, my question is a procedural one. Uh, what happens after we have the two public meetings, then we would have amongst uh, the committee a discussion and a vote over which we wanted to put on the ballot. Is that correct? Or does that go then to the Board of County Commissioners and then they take it from there? Mr. Could Chair, I I yes, yes, thank you. Uh, the Charter Review Board proposals do not go to the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, like the citizen initiative, the board is not involved. Uh, it goes straight to Craig Latimer. So what I am getting from the board is that I would draft the nine single member and the five four split uh, for your consideration. And whichever one or both that you want to move forward, I could finish the drafting and we could set those for public hearing.
Thank you. And, uh, so I, I'm going to interrupt here um, with Representative Fig's spot. So just for clarity, um, at our next meeting, if we had a discussion, and Mary Helen, correct me if I go off here, um, we have a discussion between the two proposals. One is voted upon and moved forward for public hearing. We are hearing from the public just to see if there's any unreadiness, but it really does not stop uh, this going to the ballot at that point. That's correct. Okay. All right, uh, Representative Fig, and then Mr. Scarola. I'm not sure that this is, Mr. Chairman. Uh, are yes. You, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm not sure this is the appropriate time for these remarks, but I'm going to go ahead and make them anyway. I'm very concerned about the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're going to put before the public possibly a proposal that would expand the county commissioners by two members and perhaps go to another whole structure that is to say single member districts as opposed to a mixture. We don't know how that will turn out yet. I would hate to see this be on the ballot and fail. And this is a time when people are going to be sensitive about spending more money on government, i.e. two more salaries, et cetera. So I'd like everybody to just keep that in mind that these might not be, a, this might not be the best time for expanding the county commission. It might be that 20, the next election cycle would be a more appropriate time. And with that, I'm not trying to stop what's going on now. I'm just giving, passing out some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Scarola, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Respecting um, Ms. Fig's comments, um, I also don't want to foreclose out the opportunity that we could do it if we wanted to. And that's really my motivation yes. here. If, if, if we could schedule the dates and this board could decide to not uh, follow through with it. Um, uh, if I understand the process uh, correctly. So I'd be supportive of setting up some form of some skeleton of process now before we leave tonight uh, that would enable us to do, to move forward should we decide to do that. Thank you, Ms. Yates. You recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question has to do with timing as well. If we come back on August 4th, and the language has to be um, available on August 18th to get on the ballot, what is considered reasonable notice to the public um, to have two public hearings? And also to that point, um, what are we required other than just posting it on the county website to provide actual notice to um, the county? Mr. Chair, if I may address that. Yes, please. Um, the reasonable notice is basically just the Sunshine Law. The Charter does not set that out. Um, so uh, we certainly could accommodate the reasonable notice. And again, I can get with communications that it's very effective in getting the word out. They have a lot of different means to do so, different platforms. So I can work with them to uh, ensure that we have enough, you know, as much notice as we want. Uh, I would assume that this is going to get the media's attention as well, should you proceed forward. So there might be some coverage there as well. Thank you. So, uh, you know, we, we talked about a poll. I want to ask this question um, and staff, if this is too aggressive of a timeline, please let me know. Would anyone here, any of the board members, have an issue with saying we have a called meeting on the 21st to discuss the two proposals if they're written by that time? This is Beth. I don't see any scheduling conflicts from the county calendar on that date. That basically would provide two weeks for the language to get crafted and for us to get together. And at that point, um, whether or not we decide to proceed would be up to us. And it is a very tight window at that point between the 21st and the 18th when the language would be due. But it does provide you, looking at my calendar here, 
three full weeks to have public hearings if we decided to move forward. And I see Dr. Fox and then Mr. Scarola. I'm sorry, I had written down August 4th for something, but I didn't write down what it was. You, was there a deadline? That's our, next, that's our next scheduled meeting. Oh, okay. That's on the calendar. But we could do a special called meeting for this item on the 21st. And okay. The actual, deadline the, into public meeting. the actual deadline's August 18th, you said? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Scaroli? Sorry about that, Ed. Left my hand up. I've taken it down. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Berry, you're recognized. Um, so I have a question in regards to once we meet after July 21st, the time frame of which we alert the community, the two meetings, uh, does it state um, anywhere that we have to have the meetings um, concurrently? I mean, either one, one each week, can it be back to back? What, What's the, the actual, not saying time frame, but how we craft those two meetings to get it out to the public in a timely fashion for them to select on this date or this date to attend? Does it have to be That's week by week question. or day by day? <clears throat> uh, if I understand Ms. Ferris correct uh, from the last question, um, there isn't a set time frame, but in fairness to the public, I think we have to provide uh, a reasonable amount of notice. And if we were to meet at a special call meeting on the 21st and move the proposal forward, those are big ifs. I would, I would like to see us take our normally scheduled meeting on the 4th and have that be one of the public hearings. And then um, possibly the 17th do a special meeting on that Monday evening, if that's possible as the second public meeting, because at that point, whatever we decide on the 21st would be the language that would move to the ballot. So we wouldn't have any more discussions. It's really just hearing from the public at that point. Dr. Fox, you're recognized. I apologize. I forgot to take my hand down. No worries. Any other comments? So again, once again, the 21st, is there anyone that has an issue with us possibly having a meeting if the language is ready for that time? All right, wonderful. I'm gonna take that. Um, we've discussed our, <laughs> I'm gonna move into new business. Do we have anything for new Mr. business? Mr. Tonight? Chair, this is Beth. Um, yeah. Are we looking at six o'clock on the 21st? Yes, we'll keep the same time, six o'clock. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Well, does anyone have anything for a new business tonight? I, Representative Shaw, see your hand. Hey, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, with regard to the county administrator discussion, I, I am, I just want you to let her staff know I am particularly interested in the fact that there always seems to be a conflict anytime there's an emergency between the county administrator and the elected officials as to who has the power to do what. And that is a subject that I am, uh, I would be interested in hearing some about her thoughts about. Noted. And I think staff can, will also relay that message. Or you wouldn't be referring to hurricanes or anything of that nature, are you? <laughs> don't even mention that with all we got going on, man. Don't put that, don't put that in the air, huh? All right, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mueller, you're recognized. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to the 21st uh, meeting, sorry to go back to that, but uh, I believe we need to do that by motion in a second, don't we, Mary Helen? Um, no, it would be a special call meeting um, by the chair. I believe that's within my authority, but if it's not, somebody correct me. It could be the one I would, this is Mary Helen. Um, I think it would be most appropriate for the record to have a vote to set that. Okay. Uh, Ed, Ed, can I, uh, this is Jamie Scarola. Can I throw in a comment, please? Yes, Mr. Scarola, you're recognized. Yeah, listen, with respect to the 21st, um, that is the county's full day of um, land use hearings, uh, morning and evening. Is there any other date right in it? in there that uh, might work?
No, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, was the comment made with respect to uh, August 4th or the 21st? No, July 21st, um, I suggested as a special call meeting, which I could do, but I do agree for the record, we should go ahead and take it as a vote. So I'll entertain a motion for that. Um, then I'll make that motion for debate? a special meeting. I have a motion for a special meeting on the 21st of this month for Mrs. Scarola. Is there a second? I'll Dr. Second. Fox? Second. Okay, is there any unreadiness? Mr. Chair, I got a quick question. Uh, would we have to have a separate motion as well for a potential second public hearing on the August 4th meeting or is the fact that we have the, the meeting scheduled enough to be able to hear it then? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Mary Helen. It is already on the calendar and we would provide the appropriate notice for the August 4th meeting. For the public okay. hearing. That's correct. Mr. Okay, cool. Mr. Chair, that, that August 4th date is the one I was referring to. Um, the county has all day land use meetings, morning and evening. Uh, um, I couldn't do it. Is there any other date that that meeting could be moved to? Oh, okay. I, I get where you're going here. Um, let's do it with the 21st for now, because you made a motion and it's been seconded yeah. by Dr. Fox on the 21st with a special call meeting to address yeah. the language. All right, any other discussion? All right, are you ready for the question? All in favor by sign of aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. okay, Mr. Scarola, uh, Scarola, as it refers to August 4th, you're saying that uh, that's our normally scheduled meeting, but it would be turned into a public hearing meeting if we move that any one of the two proposals forward. Yeah, that's the that's the date of the county's proposed moving of all their land use hearings. They're moving them around now because of all the um, the issues that are happening. Um, but that's the proposed date. Is there any way that date can be moved? The third or the fifth or the sixth? Um. What, I, let me let me dig a little further. What's the concern with that date? I mean, for the public being able to express themselves on that date potentially. Well, so so that that is a a big uh, component of it, in that a lot of people that would have an interest in it would, you know, likely also go to these various county hearings. So uh, it takes them out of the equation. Well, we are allowed to move the date um, as we see fit. Is there a, a potential motion for a, date, a better date that week? So I'll throw out August 3rd, but also as far as I'm concerned, the 5th would be fine, the 6th would be fine. Um, I'll make a motion that we, we move our August 4th meeting to August 3rd at 6 p.m. Is there a second? <laughs> Going once, I don't hear a second. Twice. I'll make the second, Mr. Chair. Oh, you you were just you're on the cusp. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor to move our normal meeting August fourth to August third. Uh, do we have any discussion, Mr. Mueller? I see your hand. No, I'm sorry. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Are we ready for the question? Oh, Mr. Representative Shaw, I see your hand. Yeah, I, Mr. Chair. Thanks. I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but the meeting is set on my calendar. That is when the meeting was. The rest of my schedule <clears throat> doesn't look great, so I'm probably going to vote against any motion to change. And I don't. I, I just want to give context as to why I'm being Debbie Downer, but I would rather not move it. It's already been set. That's why it's set so far in advance, so that we don't play musical meeting dates. All right, Ms. Delavern, you're recognized. Yeah. So. We're going to have, we have to have two public hearings. So if somebody has a conflict on August the 4th because of the um, land use meeting, they still have the option to come to the second public hearing, correct? That is correct. That answers my question. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. All right, are we ready for the question? I don't see any more comments. All right, we have a motion that's been properly seconded to move the meeting that's normally scheduled for August 4th to Monday, August 3rd at 6 p.m. We'll go ahead and do this by roll call vote and we'll hand it over to the clerk. <clears throat> Noreen? Yes. Barry? No. Brian? Sorry? No. Brian? No. Was that a no? That is correct. It is a no. Thank you. Delaverne? No. Big? No. Fox? No. Johnson? Yes. Mueller? No. Corolla? Yes. Shaw? No. Stewart? No. Thrower? No. Wood? No. Yates? No. The motion failed three to 11. Members Barry, Bryant, Delaverne, Fig, Fox, Mueller, Shaw, Stewart, Thrower, Wood, and Yates voted no. All right, so we will keep our original date of August 4th uh, for the meeting or a public meeting, depending on the outcome of the 21st. All right, anything else for under new business? All right, we're going to move on to, uh, oh, Ms. Deliver, is that your hand? Well, I just didn't know if we, because it may be a, um, you know, if we're doing it as a public hearing and we have to have two public hearings, should we go on and at least today set the date for the second public hearing so people can fold their calendars instead of waiting till the 21st? There a motion to uh, to look at a date. If, does somebody have a suggested date? What? I don't think we need to debate whether we want to do that per se. Ms. Stewart, I see your hand. You're recognized. Uh, well, just for clarification, it was my understanding the second or our regular charter review meeting is the second public hearing. Is that correct? Uh, that would be the first. If we were to move a proposal forward on the 21st of this month, that next meeting on August 4th would be the first public meeting, and okay. then we'd have to fit the second. Thank you. That's correct. Um, I will say, I'm just going to throw this out there, uh, the Monday the 17th may present an opportunity. It's the day before. Um, it would go to the supervisor of elections if there's language that's moved forward. Whoa. Mr. Chair, uh, Jamie Scarola, I can't do that that day. Anyone have any thoughts or we leave it as it is? Ms. Delavern, you're recognized. I, I, I apologize. I just I'm trying to understand the process because once we have the two public hearings, do we need to have one more meeting to say, okay, this is what we've heard from the public. We need to decide if we want to move forward or not. Or once we have the public hearings, that means we're definitely moving forward. So then I don't understand the purpose of the public hearing. Uh, um, that is the, the, your scenario. The first scenario is what would be accurate. Whatever is decided to move forward on the 21st is the language that we are suggesting to the public they put on the ballot. There wouldn't be an additional meeting for us to take it off or anything. It's just literally hearing from the public. Mary Helen, correct me if I'm wrong, please. You are correct. It's interesting. It probably should be the other way around. Dr. Fox, you're recognized. 
that's what I was just going to say. So our meeting on the 21st is extremely significant. We will decide as a committee which, if any, of the language will go to the ballot. That decision will be made on July 21st. Then we will give two opportunities for the public to comment on that, but that will not change, correct? Am I correct? The fact that it has gone to the ballot. That is correct. And I'm not being corrected. That is correct. So, Sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, Ms. Delavern, I see your hand up. Sorry, I just forgot to take it down. Okay. It's too many buttons. Miller, you're recognized. I was just going to say, um, I you know, want to apologize, to Mr. Scarola. I know he's not available, but as I look at the calendar, it looks like the August 17th date is the one that makes the most sense. So I would move for that second uh, public hearing date to be August 17th. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion that's been properly seconded by Mr. Shaw. Is there any unreadiness or debate? We're ready for the question. We will take it to the clerk for the roll call vote. Narain? Yes. Barry? Yes. Bryant? Yes. Delaverne? Yes. Big? Yes. Fox? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Mueller? Yes. Scarola? No. Shaw? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Thrower? Y yes. Wood? Yes. Yates? Yes. Motion carried 13 to one, Mr. Scarola voted no. Thank you all very much. So we have our date set uh, for any potential public hearings and for our next special call meeting. Um, public comments, Mr. Brewer, uh, is Mr. Nash on the line or any other uh, citizen? Yes, sir, last time I checked, Mr. Nash was on the line. Mr. Nash, are you available? I am. Mr. You Nash, floor, you have the floor uh, starting at three minutes. Great. And uh, thank you. Uh, go. Thank you, Chair Duran. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, it's nice to have all 14 members uh, being committed to the cause. Thank you all for uh, showing up at these events under the circumstances of a pandemic and our other challenges. <laughs> I just want to give you all something to think about. Um, very interesting that you all move forward on both of those uh, uh, directives regarding the districts to go to either nine single member districts or the uh, continuing the hybrid that the county has of single member and county wide seats to a 5-4 uh, spread adding two districts in both instances. Just want to give the 14 of you something to think about uh, to go to single member districts, you would be reducing the voting power of the public by 75%. You would be reducing their votes from four to one. Um, and going to the hybrid, uh, which is unique for Hillsboro, but seems to be working, uh, to nine seats with five single member districts and four countywide, you would be increasing uh, the voting power of the public uh, from four to five. So as you're contemplating what your choices are moving forward, do you want to be known as the board that has reduced the voting power of the public significantly um, or not? So uh, I wish you all well in the process to get to a final answer. Um, stay safe, everyone, and thank you for your hard work. 
Thank you, Mr. Nash, for your comments tonight. All right. Members, this is the longest meeting that we've had. I have a feeling we have a long one in our very near future. So, uh, you know, rest up, research, please stay safe, do all that you can to keep yourselves and your family well, and we will be talking soon. Have a great evening. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week. Hi, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for using WebEx. Visit our website at www.webex.com.